day presentation um, on our first Monday um, lecture series. Um, my name is Steve Chase. I'm the director of education here, almost here for a year. I started last October, and um, it's very um, exciting to work with Pendle Hill. Um, tonight's talk about the struggle for labor rights and corporate accountability in a global economy is so appropriate for a Labor Day because um, a, friend, a mutual friend of Barbara's and mine, a woman named Betsy Leander Wright, had a bumper sticker on her car which said, the, uh, the labor movement, the people who brought you the weekend. And I think it's important to remember that many of the things that we treasure about life in the United States are uh, results of the labor movement organizing and having collective power to improve the dignity and conditions of people at work. Um, and with the increasingly globalized economy, it has created many opportunities for companies to ignore and lower wages and lower st um, quality standards in, in work life. And, and so it's becoming a real challenge. Um, I just want to start with an image, which is Martin Luther King. And I was thinking about today, in, in the, to introduce this, I was first thinking of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German theologian, who made a really important distinction about people of faith. He said, on one end of the continuum are people who are involved in what he called easy believism. And then on the other end of the continuum are people who are engaged in costly discipleship. And I think Martin Luther King is one of the great patterns and examples in the United States, certainly in the 20th century, of be a costly discipleship, of really being faithful. And what I found interesting is I recently read a book by Tavis Smiley about the last year of his life. Um, and it was such a fruitful year. He started on April 4th, 1967 at the Riverside Church, coming out very boldly and strongly against the war in Vietnam. He had been opposed to it for two years, but largely silent publicly, only talking about it privately. And he was hammered. He lost all sorts of popularity. Um, quotes liberal newspapers like the uh, New York Times savaged him um, and were very, very uh, dismissive and cruel. And he was then merging the civil rights movement with the peace movement. Then he started traveling all over the country, starting what was going to be the Poor People's Campaign, which was going to be an encampment in Washington, D.C. that would have people of every race in the United States coming together to demand an end for poverty. And so he was moving from constitutional civil rights to sort of human rights and economic justice, which he considered one of the three pillars of a good society and the beloved community. And then he was heard about the strike of the sanitation workers in Memphis. And it didn't fit in his schedule. It was inappropriate for all the work he was trying to get together in the very um, narrow time frame for the Poor People's Campaign. But he couldn't not go. And I was just rereading a bit of that, the, that struggle. And so the sanitation workers, two men had been killed in the back of a sanitation truck because it hadn't been kept up properly, two sanitation workers. The, 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 the sanitation workers went on strike in order to have the right to organize a union. Um, they were maced, they were clubbed, police repression was um, really extensive. And on March 18th, King gave a speech to the sanitation workers, and he spontaneously during that time, I found out today, um, said what we need to do is have a general strike, that not just sanitation workers, but all uh, unionized workers and workers in solidarity should do a work stoppage one day. And in a speech, he linked it to his religious vision of faithfulness. And he was pretty tough in the crowd. And so I just want to set a little stage for tonight's talk. One is he called on the mayor in Memphis and said, if you do it unto the least of these my children, you do it unto me. And so he quoted Jesus 
and really asked him to see the plight of the sanitation workers and work with them to help create a good situation. Then he went on critiquing, not critiquing, but saying the civil rights movement was the first phase and the second phase was moving to economic justice. And he said, we know now that it isn't enough to integrate lunch counters. What does it profit a man to be able to eat an integrated lunch counter if he doesn't have enough money to buy lunch? And then he told a story in this speech. And I think it's really important for us to think about because I think sometimes when thinking about the labor movement, we don't really know enough of, of, of what we could do and what's involved, but it seems an important part of really creating a beloved community. And King goes, you know, Jesus reminded us in a magnificent parable one day that a man went to hell because he didn't see the poor. His name was Davis, and there was a man by the name of Lazarus who came daily to his gate in need of basic necessities of life. And Davis didn't do anything about it, and he ended up going to hell. There's nothing in that parallel parable that says that Davis went to hell because he was rich. His wealth was an opportunity to bridge the gap, the gulf that separated him from his brother Lazarus. Davis went to hell because he passed by Lazarus every day, but he never really saw him. He never really addressed him. And Barbara who has worked in the field of labor solidarity internationally for over 25 years with the Institute for Global Labor Rights, Labor and Human Rights, um, has steadfastly helped people see the situation and helped them figure out what are the levers that they might do to help the situation of uh, marginalized and exploited workers all over the world and has been a big part of the anti-sweatshop movement that students and com uh, communities of faith have been so active in. Um, and I've known Barbara for 36 years, and so it's great to have one of my oldest friends come to speak to us tonight. And one little anecdote I will say is that when she was a freshman at Swarthmore, she took an aptitude test for careers, and it turned out the two careers that she had most aptitude for, according to the test, was either a priest or a labor organizer. <laughs> I think she kind of does well on both counts. So without any further ado, Barbara Briggs, the Associate Director of the Institute, talking to us tonight about the struggle for labor rights and corporate accountability in a global economy. Thank you. Well, thanks. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. And I thought, since it's Labor Day, that we might start with a bit of our own labor history. So I'm going to take another step even further back to March 25th, 1911, when a fire broke out in a factory in New York City, a factory called the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. Um, it was just off Washington Square in New York, and workers were working forced overtime on Saturday. They smelled smoke, but they didn't panic. They went to the cloakroom, they made for the stairwell, but when they got there, the doors were locked. And then the fire burst through the floor, uh, the fabric burst into flames, um, and they were surrounded, and there was no way for them to get out because they were locked in. And the 146 young women and girls died on that day. They were in their teens and their 20s. They burned to death. They were asphyxiated. Many of them jumped uh, to their death from the 6th, 7th, and 8th floor, hit the pavement. Um, people said they looked like bundles of cloth uh, and that that day the, the streets ran in blood. Um, what happened next was really interesting, the thing I really want to talk about. The funeral processions started out in grief, and they started with 50,000 people. They moved to 100,000, they moved to 200,000, and from grief came anger, and a social movement was formed, and the call, the demand was, who will protect our working girls? 
Um, and out of that came a movement to reform these sweatshops, to end sweatshop abuses and child labor. And from 1911 well into the 70s, we had a really uh, ever advancing process. Workers had more and more rights, and I'm forgetting the slideshow, which is too bad, because here's the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. Um, just some images of what it looked like. Um, and here are some of the marches. There are even better pictures than that. Uh, there was a real end to child labor and sweatshops during that time. Workers won the right to organize. There were uh, legislation protecting workers' rights to organize and bargain collectively, minimum wage laws, maximum hours, health and safety laws. And workers in this country did really well, ever and ever better. You could, in the garment industry in the United States, make a living wage during that period, and your rights were protected. Uh, another dynamic began in the 70s and 80s with communications and transportation uh, advances. Globalization became possible. And in, the, in the 80s, as I was just starting the work, uh, we were seeing in the garment industry, but in electronics and other industrial production as well, factories closing up shop and moving, moving to Asia, moving to China, moving to Central America, um, and towns across the United States were losing their main places of employment, uh, and the companies were essentially engaged in a race to the bottom, pitting workers and countries in a competition based on who will accept the lowest wages, the least benefits, um, and looking for you know, the cheapest and most vulnerable workers. Uh, that's kind of how we started, you know, where we started the work. At this point, 98% of the clothing that we buy here in the United States is made offshore, well into the 90, 90th percentile of toys, shoes, electronics, uh, appliances are all made offshore in China, in Central America, in Indonesia, in Bangladesh, where workers are paid pennies and do not have the fundamental rights and are not protected by the laws that we fought for and won in the early part of the last century. So we have a whole new set of working girls now um, and they're in countries like Bangladesh, where my organization, the Institute for Global Labor and Human Rights, does a lot of work. And I'd like to just tell some of the stories of what we see. Um, and just with a couple of little pictures and then a bit more detail. Uh, three months shy of the 100th anniversary of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire in December of 2010, there was another fire in a factory called That's It Sportswear. It was owned by the Hamim Group, uh, this factory, which is one of the largest garment producers in the country. They have 30,000 workers total. total. Um, in That's It, the fire broke out. 28 workers were killed because, again, they were locked into the factory. And again, they were working forced overtime. That's why they were being locked in. They were making clothing for Gap and VF, as well as another, a, a number of other labels. And then again, on November 24th in 2012, a fire broke out in a factory called Tazreen. 112 were killed. Again, the workers were locked in. They couldn't get out. The fire swept up the stairwells. There were no safe exits. There weren't any sprinkler systems, no equipment, fire equipment that could rescue the workers. Um, and again, like in the Triangle fire and like in Hamim, many of the workers jumped to their deaths. And the way workers explain it in Bangladesh is that they jumped because they wanted their parents to have a body to mourn. Um, th these were only two of the largest fires during this last, you know, during that, during that period. Um, and then we come to 2013. In April, on April 24th, um, I got up early and got up to a phone call, and it was our representative in Bangladesh, and I don't know where that 
that's the Tazreen factory, it was our representative in Bangladesh, and he said that a building had collapsed, a factory building. It was a, a building called um, Rana Plaza, and it was, and again, I'm having a hard time with the slide here, um, it's a building called Rana Plaza, um, which was a, a large commercial building it was actually licensed to be five floors, but they'd built it up three more floors, so it was eight floors. The lower uh, stories had a bank and some stores, commercial space, but the upper floors were all garment factories. It was five separately owned factories. The workers, two days before, had seen large cracks in the building. They, they were big. They were in the outer walls. You could put your hand through them. You could look through and see the outside. And the workers had gotten really upset, and the building had been evacuated, the whole thing. Um, an inspector had come and said, this is a very serious structural flaw, and nobody should go back into the building until it's fixed. That was the 22nd of April. On the 24th, uh, the workers came back to find out about the repairs and to find out when they were going to be paid, because it was toward the end of the month, and when they'd be able to get back in and, and start working. But uh, even though the repairs hadn't been done, they were ordered to go back in. The owners of the five separate factories, managers, came down and told the workers that there were orders due at the end of the month and they had to get back in to finish them because if they didn't finish the orders, they wouldn't be paid. Then the owner of this factory, this, this building, Rana Plaza, the guy named Sohel Rana who had built, um, built the building and named it after himself, uh, came and he was sort of a local strongman and he came with thugs and he said, if you don't get into the building now, uh, your bones will be broken. And the thugs had sticks and they started hitting people. So the workers went in. That was 8 in the morning um, on April 24th. They started working. They worked for 45 minutes or so and then the electricity kicked off, which is what happens very frequently in Bangladesh. Everybody's ready for it. The generators kicked on in all five factories. So they kicked on and pretty soon the building started to vibrate and then started to sway and then it came down. It came down with nearly 3,000 workers inside and on that day 1,137 workers were killed. Um, this is just a couple of images of what it looked like on the day. Friends of ours in a union office nearby uh, heard the building come down and they heard the screams and were, you know, at that point trying to get people out of the rubble. Some people were rescued, well over a thousand workers. I mean, these are some of the people who were killed. Hundreds were missing. Families were on the streets looking for their loved ones. Um, and for months afterward, we, you know, we visited Bangladesh about six weeks after. And there were people on the streets like this. They were still looking for their family members. Um, this is a hospital. Again, six weeks after, well over a thousand workers were severely injured, um, lost limbs, broken their backs, broken their legs, um, head injuries. Many of these workers will never be able to work again you know, physically, and many of them because the tra of the trauma, they just can't go into a building anymore. Well over a year later, there were still bones being found in the rubble. And many of these, many of the workers will never be found. Um, since then, this is again two years ago, a little over two years ago, um, a couple of things have changed. I did want to say though that, I mean, the, sort of the worst thing about or one of the worst things about this tragedy is that the workers knew so clearly that the building was dangerous. There was no doubt. And the fact that they had no way to fight, they didn't want to go in, but they were ordered to, and they had no representation. And I can't help thinking that if they had had a representative, someone to speak for them, you know, a union that represented them, 
that the, that day would have played out very differently and maybe thousands of people would be alive and uninjured. Um, the factories, by the way, were making big international brands. They were producing for JCPenney, they were producing for My, uh, Highmark of the UK, H&M, The Children's Place, Benetton, um, well over a dozen other international brands. Um, since then, and I should say that all of these companies have codes of conduct. If you write any single one of them or look on their website, you will see that they, because there has been a great deal of concern expressed by religious people, by students especially who've been out front on this issue, um, and communities across the country, the companies have responded and they will now tell you they, they protect and assure every labor and human and women's right under the sun. No forced labor, no forced overtime, no child labor, but they're happy to be oblivious um, until something happens. And I think perhaps the outcome of this tragedy is that they've figured out finally that it's really, it's really inconvenient to have hundreds of your workers, your workers, uh, killed, crushed to death, burned to death, um, while they're making while they're making your stuff, you know, no matter where they're making it. So, U.S. and European companies have, to some degree, stood up to the plate and have moved to put some money and some attention into making these buildings in Bangladesh more safe. Um, they are beginning to insist on uh, safe fire, ex fire exits, on doors not being locked. Uh, they actually had to bring in production of fire doors. There wasn't such a thing as a fire door in Bangladesh before that. Uh, they're beginning to do things like fire drills and make sure there's training. Um, but so, so there's, there, you know, at least maybe fewer workers will die. What we see, though, is that even in the cleanest, safest facilities, bad things happen inside, and the same bad things continue to happen. So just for instance, um, in the Monday factory, we did an expose with, uh, with CBS, and this was uh, late in 2013, went into, walked into a factory one day and found these girls. They were 11, 12, and 13 year, year olds. And there were over 50 of them working in this factory. And they were working until midnight, many, many nights. And they were producing for Walmart and Asics. Uh, we helped put some of these girls back in school. But this is factories across the country. And I mean, child labor has diminished a little bit. You don't see eight-year-olds. And sometimes when they're girls like this, a tech, uh, you know, a technique of the factory is to put them on the night shifts because the international monitors are back in their hotels by, by nighttime. Um, but this kind of stuff is happening. Um, it's just some of the, we met with them, and they just talked to us about what it was like working in this factory. And it was abusive. It was nasty. They were exhausted. Obviously, they couldn't go to school. Um, another story that I wanted to talk about in a tiny bit more detail is a factory called Next Collections. So a factory with 3,750 workers in it. Um, it was owned by that same group, the Hameen Group, with 30,000 workers. 75% of their production at, at the time when we first started talking with the workers was uh, making Gap's Old Navy label. We met with a group of workers, and the only time we could meet with them was at 10 o'clock at night, because they were working until 1 in the morning, but they got a supper break at 10. So we met in a scummy little Chinese restaurant on the second floor way back, and it was dim, and it was safe for them to meet there, because who the heck would go there in terms of international people, I guess. And we met with this group of workers, and we had never seen anybody look more tired. These were young men. They were in their 20s. There were women working, but the women tended to be sort of closer to home and couldn't meet with us on that day. Uh, these young men in their 20s looked like they were 45. They had bats under their eyes. They were emaciated. They'd been working until midnight and one in the morning for months. They were generally working seven days a week. Um, 
the company ran two sets of books. So the pay stubs that they got said they worked 40 hours a week with two hours of voluntary overtime six days a week, but they always got Fridays off. What really happened was they were working seven days a week. They were working until midnight most days in the finishing section, sometimes till one, sometimes all night. I mean, it's impossible to think how they did it. They didn't even know how they were doing it. Um, so they were sick, they were exhausted, um, they were living in poverty. The company, in addition to forcing them to work all these hours, was not paying them for all the hours. So they basically had a triple system going on. They had the one formal set of books, which was for the buyers. They could show the pay stubs, they could show the payroll, and it looked like everything was legal, and they weren't, the workers weren't working any more than you know, less than 60 hours a week. And then there was what the workers were really working, but they were getting cheated a few percent or so of their overtime pay. Now, some of these workers were really smart. They wrote down their hours every single day. They knew when they went into the factory. They knew that when they left. They knew when they got a lunch break. They were keeping track of their hours. They knew what they worked, and then they knew what they got paid, which they got paid in cash, by the way, so they couldn't really check it through, through bank accounts. Um, and that at the time we were working with them and started, you know, at that time they were making 20 to 24 cents an hour is what they were making. Their families were subsisting on rice and lentils and vegetables. And they said that by the third week in the month, the money was over and they were eating just rice. And, you know, that was kind of it. Uh, physical punishment and illegal fire firings were pretty much the norm. And if and it was, by the way, 80% women in the factory. And if you got pregnant, you would be forced out without your legal maternity leave. I mean, wages are so low in Bangladesh. There is uh, a law that says you are to get eight weeks paid time before the expected birth, eight weeks after the birth. Um, and that paid time is really a matter of life and death for you know, for the women and their babies and their families, because if you don't have income for the period for that period of time, you don't eat. So, uh, but they weren't getting that. What would happen instead is that uh, the women, when they started to show, would start to be put in the hardest job, and the supervisors would push them harder and harder, and basically say, "You're pregnant. You can't do the job anymore. You should leave." you should leave, here's a letter, sign this. And they would force them to sign a letter of resignation so they wouldn't get any of the pay or benefits that accrued to them, plus they wouldn't get the maternity leave because they'd quit. Uh, and that's what happened. Um, it happened, the same thing, if I can get this to work, which it doesn't seem to want to. That's interesting. Hmm. I'm pressing the right button here. Give me just a second, because I think that it's worth. Um, it's worth 10, I'll What's that? I said it's worth 10, I'll stack. That's really funny. Are you clicking on the image? Yeah. Um, okay, thank you. And thank you. Here's some of you working at night. Here's what they were making. This is, uh, we went to the store, almost all this whole panel, they were making these skinny jeans for little girls, which I thought was kind of ironic. Uh, they also had baby skinny jeans, by the way. Um, and this whole panel was made in Bangladesh, and it was coming out of this factory. This is how the workers were living on their 20 to 24 cents an hour. This is the two communal spigots were shared by eight or 10 households couple of bathrooms that look like this. This is uh, a family's home. Uh, they're sleeping on the floor on just a you know a couple of pieces of cloth and the whole family lived here. This is Zesman and her her husband she was fired for being pregnant. Another couple they lost the baby. Um, now this is uh, Tanya and Masrul, and they were actually really interesting. They were 
very bright. They were both supervisors in this factory. Uh, and she got pregnant. And the same thing started to happen to her. Now, she knew the labor law, and she knew that she was due maternity leave, and she was determined that she would have it. Um, and so she refused to be fired or to quit, and they every single day pressured her, you know, sign the letter, sign the letter. She said no. She said, you know, absolutely won't sign it. Um, they started to threaten her, if you don't sign, your husband is going to get in trouble. We're going to put your husband in trouble. She said no. Um, about this time, we were working on our report, and we had a very good Wall Street Journal uh, journalist, a young woman named Shelley Brancho, uh, who went down to Bangladesh and interviewed these two. Uh, what happened next was she kept saying no. He backed her up. Um, they finally set him up. They were telling him to get your wife to sign this thing. She wasn't doing it. Uh, they finally gave him a stack of pants and said, you know, take this to the chemist's office. He took the stack of pants. He walked out the door, and he was grabbed by a manager, dragged back in, accused of stealing the pants, uh, beaten by management, beaten with sticks on his feet, scared to death. They then called the police, accused him of stealing. Uh, he was in jail for 48 hours before our, we and our partners were able to get him a lawyer and get him out. Uh, what the company didn't know is that, uh, you know, we were kind of on it. And Shelley Banjo was able to interview this couple. And they <laughs> did a really good job with the interview. And she uh, printed this thing in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, and, you know, there they are telling their story. And we put a report out. And they told the truth. Uh, Gap was really upset. They, again, they have a lovely code of conduct. They really care, and they, they're, they're monitoring people, and their compliance people are like the, the best, most lovely human rights people that money can buy. I mean, they're really nice. Uh, and they were very upset. Uh, and they actually did come down on this company with army boots, almost, um, and demanded change, you know, sent in a whole mess of people to be in the factory on the ground, uh, and things changed. Uh, these workers are now working an eight-hour day with no more than two hours of overtime. They get Fridays off. They're working a six-day work week. Uh, they have their vacation and sick leave. Uh, pregnant women, like Zessman got all her money, by the way. Uh, this is Zessman with her baby. Um, and she, you know, when we met her the next time, was really pretty happy. Uh, and People are getting their wages and their benefits paid correctly. No more double books, none of that anymore. That actually began a, a, a turnaround in a string of factories for us. It started with Next Collections, but basically all of Hameen Group started operating in this new way and with new vigilance on the part of the labels. Uh, they also don't know who we're working with, and Bangladeshi workers are really, really good networkers, and they're very brave. And so if stuff happens in some of these factories, it's, you know, we can get to know about it pretty quickly. Um, after the Hameen group, there was the Windy group. It was another 10,000 workers. After that, it was Orbitex and Ebonair. After that, it was a factory called Jeans Plus. So at this point, it's over 60,000 workers who are now getting maternity leave and their benefits and decent working hours, you know, with a certain amount of backlighting, but still a lot better than it was. We're now working uh, on a very large uh, sweater factory. It's another 10,500 workers. That one's in process, and it's going to be a tough fight. It's a tough management. But the point I wanted to make is that a couple of things. I mean, one is that these really are our workers now. They're not covered by our labor law or by international labor standards yet or by our standards of decency, but they are our workers. And the important thing is that our voices, and especially voices of people of faith, uh, can help these workers win their rights. I mean, it's absolutely effective because these are our companies. and they don't like us knowing the truth. I mean, it almost doesn't matter 
how loud Zussman or, or, or Tanya yell about things. You know, in some ways, if they complain in Bangladesh, it just it doesn't go anywhere unless there's somebody listening. You know, unless there's the international visibility. Um, and so it, it, I wanted to say the truth for many of us sort of pursuing this advocacy work is that it's done from a real deep sense of spirituality. It's done from a sense that human beings and human communities are deeply precious and have to be cared for. Um, and I do want to talk more about sort of the specific role of people of faith, which is really important, but I wanted to shift gears for a second, um, or more than a second. Um, we work out of Pittsburgh now. I, can't remember if I mentioned that. Uh, we were in New York as you know, a proper international NGO, no matter how small it should be, uh, for many, many years. But then in the recession, we ran out of money. And 2008, my daughter and I were looking at each other. We both do this work, and we're similarly financially unstable because you know, the organization goes down, we all go down. And there were, there were actually three of us at the time, and we were trying to decide if we were going to drive a cab or wash dishes. Uh, and, you know, obviously the work counted. We've got active programs in China, in Bangladesh. We've got mouths to feed, and there was no money. And the steel workers in Pittsburgh, uh, the steel workers union, uh, called us, and they said, we know you're having some trouble, but why don't you, uh, why don't you come to Pittsburgh? We've got office space, we've got phones, we'll give you computers, it'll be a chance to work more closely together. Um, and it's kind of funny, but almost kicking and screaming, we left New York, because we never, ever expected to have to leave. Um, our director, Charlie Kernigan, who's my partner in the work, was born there, and I lived in, in New York for 25 years, and loved it, thank you very much. So we left family, we left all of that behind went to Pittsburgh to work more closely with the steel workers and keep the work alive. Well, uh, right now, uh, the steel workers are in very, very tough contract negotiations in the steel industry. At the moment, the first three uh, companies that they're bargaining with are companies called Allegheny Technologies, um, US Steel, and ArcelorMittal, the giant German steel company. Uh, first in the line was uh, ATI, Allegheny Technologies. Their contract was up on August 15th, and the worker said, okay, you know, we'll, bar we'll stay working, we'll work under the old contract, and, you know, until we can come to some agreement. The company said, nothing doing, and locked them out. So we now are looking at 2,200 workers who are locked out of their jobs with no income um, in six states across the country, including a lot of facilities in, um, in Pennsylvania. Um, U.S. Steel is next. They're continuing to bargain for the, minor, for, for the moment. ArcelorMittal, they're also working on them. Uh, they have a big, giant facility in Conshohocken, by the way. I happened to see it as I was working on this, and I looked out the train window, and it's like, there it is, you know, giant set of plants. Um, but it's a very, very tough uh, bargaining, and honestly, it's hard to say what's going to happen. This is the core of this union's membership, and the companies have said, we're not going to give you a raise. We're not, you know, actually what we want is big concessions. Actually, what we want is for you to pay more of your health care, um, we want you to have bigger deductibles, workers pay more. Estimate is that families uh, could well be paying something like $6,000 more a year for health care. Uh, and we also want to cut retiree benefits, retiree benefits, retiree health care. Uh, the steel workers are saying no. Um, they don't want to do it. Uh, they're really fighting, you know, not only for their members, but for the communities for whom this is, you know, this is a core of an employment, a core of decent, well-paying jobs that sustain families. Um, 
I wanted to mention, by the way, when ATI uh, locked out its workers, they'd been preparing for a while for this. They brought in high-priced lawyers. They actually advertised on Craigslist for replacement workers. So they have brought in scabs whom they found on Craigslist, uh, and the requirement on Craigslist was that these uh, workers should be willing to be First of all, they have to be able to lift 50 pounds. They have to be able to work in a very, very high heat environment. They have to be willing to be bussed in across a picket line and work an 84-hour work week um, under high heat. And God help them if they can't handle the equipment. Uh, it's our occupational safety and health people in the building, you know, or rather the steel workers' occupational safety and health people are saying this is a you know, disaster waiting to happen because some of the equipment is, is, is quirky, it's tough. Um, last week, there was a, a, we participated in a march uh, and rally, and there were sort of steel workers solidarity marches and rallies across the country, and there was a big one in Pittsburgh. Um, and I looked at the faces of the workers, and I mean, they were many of them so worried, you know, the ones who were locked out because they're putting, you know, they're, they're worried about putting food on their families' tables, and others worried that they might be forced to strike. Um, and, you know, oh, by the way, another of the concessions that the company wants is that they don't want to have to pay overtime after an eight-hour shift. They want to be able to just pay straight time. Um, so, the company is pushing, you know, the companies are pushing really hard and the steel workers are pushing back really hard. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a trying time, it's a risky time. And honestly, you know, the steel workers are uh, worried. And, you know, these jobs are the core of so many communities uh, that they have a right to be worried. And for me, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking, you know, if the steel workers lose this fight, it's not only a matter of those jobs and the well-being of the communities. They're actually carrying a lot with them. Um, the steel workers have also been a driving force between the Blue-Green Alliance, which is a, an alliance between organized labor and the environmental movement. Uh, they're focused especially on uh, pressing for tra a transition to sustainable energy and pressing for rebuilding of our infrastructure to be energy efficient. The steel workers are also carrying uh, the National Collegiate Players Association. Uh, student athletes who are often, you know, kids from inter inner city, underprivileged kids in many cases who you know, their chance at college is to take on a football scholarship or a basketball scholarship. And they, the, the, the universities make millions off these teams. Uh, the kids, on the other hand, are made to play practices during the summer when they don't have health care, uh, health insurance. They are all a stipend. It's not necessarily enough for them, you know, to live and cover their expenses, but they're not allowed to work otherwise, and they're not allowed to receive gifts. Uh, if they get injured, they could lose their scholarship. Uh, the steel workers have picked up and helped these kids, who themselves are incredibly visionary, some of them, uh, organize and push. So they actually have won a shift to four-year scholarships instead of just a year by year. So if you blow your knee out or have a head injury, you know, at least you won't lose your chance at college. Um, but it's tough. And if the steel workers go down, that goes down too. And they've been carrying our work, as I said. I mean, they, they get it that uh, these Bangladeshi young girl garment workers are our workers now. They also get it that these young Bangladeshi women and men have something important to teach their members about the dynamics of the global economy. And they have had, um, you know, young workers in the institutes brought workers on multiple occasions to talk to their members. And the, the transformation is amazing. I mean, a sense that, you know, oh, these are workers too. And these, these girls in, you know, three-piece colorful outfits. Well, they're like us. They're like our granddaughters, they say. And if they 
can't do well, if they're abused, then our granddaughters are going to be in the same situation. It's health steel workers in some way, I think, also really sort of bridge a cultural gap and you know, move out of a sort of a real deeply entrenched racism and xenophobia that sometimes happens uh, to extend their natural sense of solidarity to you know, solidarity with people who really don't look like them and their families. And it's been sort of an amazing experience to see this union get it and use that and reach out and help their members reach out to be in solidarity with workers who are, you know, who really need hand. Um, that's, to my mind, what's at risk here. Um, and in, in a sense, the steel workers are really facing the same, you know, we're, we're looking at the same global dynamic here. I mean, we're in this race to the bottom that pits workers against one another based on who will accept the least wages and the least benefits. And it's, you know, it, 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 that's affecting, you know, workers in Bangladesh who are working for subsistence wages. And it's also pushing steel workers in U.S. communities in the same direction. Um, but it's, it's, it's also, you know, the same force, pressure to value human beings and healthy communities that can, you know, help bolster our workers, be they steel workers or be they, you know, these young workers in Bangladesh or in China or elsewhere. Uh, at the steel rally on September 1st in Pittsburgh, the religious community was there in solidarity uh, it, and there was a pretty deep bench. I mean, there were a good dozen who spoke from the podium. And uh, I just, I took down, w one Baptist minister really struck me. He was from the mill town of Braddock, which is an old, old steel town, which has seen better days, but is fighting really hard and also counts on the 550 workers of ATI who are there. Um, and this Baptist minister said, we people of faith are, stand with you, because if they beat you, they'll go after other unions. We'll be with you standing side by side one day longer, which is the steelworkers' own chant, one day longer, meaning we're going to hold up one day longer than the companies. And it's a sense that, you know, no matter how tough it gets, they're going to stick it out. Um, the accompaniment of people of faith means the world to these workers. Um, it's you know, helped union locals who are worried about their members, you know, holding them up while they're face, you know, facing and dealing with this lockout. Uh, the role of people of faith is, is enormous in this, and we've just seen it time after time. Uh, priests in Detroit defusing police who'd like to get rough with people protesting and demanding better conditions, you know, for workers in Bangladesh or China specifically. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, the people of faith provide really sort of loving allies and a critical nexus to the broader community that is, is so needed and a moral compass and a balance to what the companies are saying and press often prints that unions are a, you know, special, special interest you know, workers' members' interests are something over here as opposed to the grand system of uh, free enterprise, which is really what we all need to be going after. And these special interest unions need to be put in a tiny box. But, you know, people of faith saying, no, this is about human dignity and taking care of God's creation and taking care of our communities, it puts the thing in a whole different light. Um, you know, the actions that religious take and also students are seen as morally unassailable in a way that, you know, the organizers and the labor people are not seen. Um, letters have real impact. Shareholder action, for instance, by religious pension funds have played a critical role in our little fight as well as others. The educational events and simple accompaniment during strikes and other actions is irreplaceable. Um, and I just wanted to finish up by saying that in our work over the years, a, a real 
core concept has been one of, of sort of international visibility. This is what we need to do. We need to tell the story of these workers in Bangladesh, you know, or in some small, will, small mill town. We need to raise this concern. We need to open the public debate. And as I was thinking about this, I got to thinking, isn't this awfully similar to the friend's concept of holding someone in the light? It's just a kind of, a kind of doing that. And, you know, I just wanted to finish by saying right now, still workers across Pennsylvania and the United States are fighting for the health of families and communities. And right now, men and women workers in Bangladesh are fighting for a sustainable wage and hours that will allow them to go home to their families and take care of their families as well. And, you know, decent, non-abusive and safe working conditions um, and that solidarity, that holding these workers in the light is really needed. And I hope that we can think together about how to do that. That's all I got. So thank you, Barbara. We're also being live streamed right now. And so for questions or comments, if you can raise your hand and I'll bring the mic over so the people as the, the recording will be able to hear what your question is and then Barbara can respond. Thank you so much. My late husband grew up in Duquesne and his father worked for U.S. Steel. Mm -hmm. So, wow. Um, I'm wondering why I haven't heard anything about this on NPR, PBS, or any of the news channels about the U.S. Steel or the, the steel workers strike that's going on and the threat of the strikes that might happen as well. Um, well, I mean, ATI is a lockout. I've seen it in the press, but, you know, I mean, I look and I get, I get the stuff. Um, it's been on the Pittsburgh local NPR. I think, gosh, if I had to venture a guess, you know, would it be going too far to say that the US press doesn't tend to cover labor issues too often? Um, in, in US Steel and ArcelorMittal, they're still in contract negotiations. So there's no strike now and there's no lockout now. Uh, hopefully it won't come to that, but I guess we'll see. And, you know, pressure up front and work up front could help that not happen. I remember in the speech that King did in Memphis, he said, and we have to remember that good things in the end of repression are never given freely by the oppressor. They're always achieved through pressure and persistence and are, are won by the oppressed. And um, I do think that the media, you, know, there's, you can make a, a good case of why the information we get is the information we get and, um, to keep people from knowing and acting. Are there other comments? Paul. Yes, and I'm, I'm trying to remember for that building collapse and also the pictures. My memory was they said that this was just straight concrete, not reinforced concrete. And I just didn't know that was legal any place. Just put some rebar and stuff to hold it. They can really build these buildings without reinforced concrete? There might have been a bit of rebar, but it was crappy. Uh, what they said about the concrete is that it had way more sand in it than it was supposed to. It was really, really bad concrete. The building was also designed as a commercial space, like for stores. It wasn't designed for heavy industrial equipment. And it was designed for five floors, not eight. Yeah. And, and another problem, sort of, to add, thinking also about steel and in this country, something that I'm really going for, Steve's saying, of, of solidarity, one big union, IWW, and all that going back. But some unions, and boy, this, this, this bothered me, are going with two-tier contracts. Mm -hmm. What we will pick as the current union, and it will be a different set mm -hmm. of 
things for the new hires, and that just makes me sick. How much is that happening? I mean, here asking something about unions and also the for, for steel. Are they mm -hmm. totally avoiding that, or are they ever getting stuck with that? I'm not real far down in the weeds in terms in terms of steel worker contracts. I know the United Auto Workers have taken two tier contracts because the industry was in a disastrous condition. They did accept that. They're trying to fight their way back from that and narrow the tiers as, as the economy becomes stronger. Um, obviously, a two tier system is a horrible thing. And, you know, I mean, we're pretty close with some of the UAW members and leadership, and they really had to swallow a lot to take it. They didn't want to. Um, and as I said, they are trying to fight their way back from it now. Not a good thing, you're right. I'm wondering how the bulk or how a lot of the organizing of faith communities, that solidarity work is happening right now around which campaigns and which are the groups who are making those links, or is it just kind of emerging more spontaneously through presentations like this? It is emerging uh, from presentations like this. Uh, there is, um, there was in Chicago a religious-based sort of labor solidarity group. Uh, the Detroit Catholic Pastoral Alliance has a sort of a labor solidarity organization sort of subcommittee as well. Um, I mean, I know I I know it as. A, a sort of a, a, a network and, you know, people and groups of faith around the country that have sort of come on board with our issue who've been fabulous. I don't know if there is, I don't know that there is a unified network that works on this stuff. But people in their own congregations and in their own towns are maybe the most powerful place to stand. Other questions or comments? Did you have another one, John? It used to be National Council of Churches was working with labor. Do they still do that? Is that an, another place that we might actually have some linkage with um, labor issues? Or maybe they don't do that anymore? I don't know the answer to that. In terms of the National Council of Churches, the thing I did want to say, though, is that the Interface Center for Corporate Responsibility has done you know, a lot of really good work on shareholder stuff, including including on in this field. Now, I understand that you're working uh, very much with individuals and, and uh, laboring people. But uh, my question has to do with what's going on with, these, with the free trade agreements and with uh, uh, the, these setups where, where uh, uh, individual governments can be blocked from uh, uh, enforcing uh, like e even in the U.S., we could we could end up being uh, blocked from enforcing uh, uh, laws that that protect workers. Mm -hmm. uh, can you comment on that? Thank you. Yeah, um, we actually recently did a bunch of work on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is the sort of the free the planned free trade agreement for the. Pacific Rim area would include the United States, Canada, Mexico, Japan, Indonesia, Vietnam, Malaysia, and a bunch of other countries. Uh, and that's sort of the model that, that, that you're talking about of supposedly to unify a set of standards to allow business to take place under one set of standards. There would be supposed labor and human rights protections, but all in a unified way, so that countries would not be allowed to borrow one another from trade if bad things were happening, um, and would not be able to impose laws that, uh, that impose env environmental or labor or human rights or other laws 
in an individual way that, that blocked or impeded uh, corporations from doing business and making profits that they had reasonably expected to be able to make. Um, it's bad law, and, and it is, it's terrifying. Um, it, it is, it's uh, really, you know, the corporate lobbyists have got their hands on this thing. Big Pharma wants it very badly because they want to be able to hold on to their intellectual property. In other words, they don't want poor countries to be able to manufacture their drugs as generics. Um, big Agriculture wants the same thing. We did uh, a study of, it was actually Nike production in Bangladesh. Many, many, many of the Nike shoes. Nike makes and sells a million shoes a day. They don't make any shoes. They, um, a million pairs of shoes. They make no shoes themselves. Um, many of them are made in Vietnam by workers who are making in the vicinity of 42 cents an hour. Uh, it's, uh, it's a, a dictatorship. There are no independent organization of any kind, no free speech, um, entirely controlled. I have never had such difficulty uh, getting individual tes testimony from workers, speech, stories from inside the plants. We looked for uh, images from inside Nike plants. Do you know how many we found online images inside plants in Vietnam, Nike factory plants? I mean, you look for plants in China, and you'll find dozens of factory images. In Vietnam, you know, you Google it, you look for the images, there are two. And we looked and looked, and I know there were only two because uh, when the New York Times did an article, they used one of them. Yeah, the same ones. And it was, came out two days after our report, and people were coming to us and saying, wow, the New York Times took your report. Good for you. <laughs> and it was because there were two images out there. Um, and you know this is this is the model that we're going to have free trade with a country where there's no organization, no independent religious human rights or labor organization. Oh yeah, there's a state-controlled supposed union, uh, but the workers can't talk. There's nothing. That's the model. That's what they want to impose now. So yeah, it's scary. Barbara. Um, I remember a story that goes way back in the early days of the work, and I think it's funny but also um, purposeful. Um, when you created uh, the apparel company as a conceptual art project and did the expose on how the Agency for International Development uh, was was working illegally under U.S. law and and international law, and I just think. It's the scrappy nature of what you do um, in the work. I, th I think that's a cool story, and I would love for you to tell it. <laughs> okay. That's what's called a softball question. <laughs> yeah, but you didn't tell me ahead of time. This has been a while. Um, we, the, we started out as a little organization called the National Labor Committee, which was an ad hoc uh, committee of union presidents who were concerned about the Reagan and Bush era's intervention in Central America, giving you know military aid to the Contras and military aid to the Salvadoran military, who was then spinning off death squads, which were killing teachers and campesino organizers and trade unionists. And a number of the progressive union presidents, including Jack Shankman of the Apparel Workers Union, Owen Beaver of the UAW, and then a handful of others, uh, got together and they were convinced you know, by their staff and by their kids that this was really wrong. Uh, and so, and, and, and by the way, the AFL-CIO had always acted as a rubber stamp to the State Department. So it was like, okay, you know, we agree with this. We, you know, aid to the Salvadoran military is okay. You know, and, and we're, you know, in some ways sort of labor central body in the United States was along for the ride on that one until the National Labor Committee before my time um, said, you know, wait a minute, you know, this military aid is, is spinning off death squads that are killing union people and union leaders and not allowing workers to be organized in these countries and isn't it completely under human rights and democracy. Um, 
the committee went on for 10 years and Charlie and I came on board sort of at, at the very end of that in um, 88, 89. And then in 1990, a peace accord was signed in El Salvador and the bloody war was kind of winding, to, you know, winding down and coming to a close. And people were coming to us and saying, well, you know, obviously you're going to throw the letterhead in a drawer and what are you going to do with the rest of your life? And at that point, you know, our organization had 10 years worth of contacts, you know, very trusted allies in the labor and religious and human rights community in El Salvador um, and also in the United States, a network of, you know, religious and labor and, you know, other students and other people who were concerned and wanted to accompany Central American workers and support the human rights, particularly of workers. And we thought, wow, what an opportunity this would be to really look at what conditions are in these factories that are springing up, you know, making garments and other stuff for the U.S. We've always said that if worker rights are, are undercut in poor developing countries, that you know, we workers in the United States won't have a chance, but why don't we really look at what's happening? And one of the first things we did, we started doing some interviewing and we, we traveled to Guatemala and to Honduras, as well as talking with workers in El Salvador. In Guatemala, we ran into a factory where every single month they took all of the young girls who worked there and they would punch them in the stomach. And the idea being that if you don't let yourself be punched, you're pregnant and you get kicked out. In El Salvador, um, the main free trade zone was right next to the Air Force Base, and it was considered, trade union people told us, you know, oh, people's daughters work there, they're little girls, and they can hardly organize, but no trade unionists could go close to there because people get captured and disappeared out of the neighborhoods. Very, very dangerous. Uh, and we started, you know, looking more and more deeply into working conditions. As we were doing this studying uh, and sort of getting more deeply into it, we uh, pretty quickly came across, uh, it was first actually in, in, a, in a magazine article, we were flipping through uh, the apparel magazine, uh, one of the apparel magazines, and we came across this advertisement and it had this, you know, pretty woman of color sitting at a sewing machine and it said, um, see what El Salvador can do for you. Rosa Martinez is more than just colorful. You know, she can make your clothing for you at, you know, and, and, and you can, you pay Rosa Martinez 50 cents an hour. And it, you know, sort of went on that Rosa had very nimble fingers and she was very efficient and that, you know, you can get your stuff done and it's very cheap. And we looked at the bottom and the ad had been taken out by this group called Fusades. And we, you know, what the heck is that? And we did a little bit of studying, and we found that what it was was um, a, a lobby group that was uh, Salvadoran business elite garment owners, and it was funded by USAID. And USAID was actually funding this group to take out this ad, and also they had offices in New York and Miami, and they were essentially cold calling apparel companies and saying, you know, idiot, what are you doing paying $9 an hour in New Jersey when you can pay Rosa Martinez 50 cents an hour? And by the way, a year later, Rosa Martinez's wage had gone down to 33 cents an hour in the same ad. Um, and it was a, an actual drop. I mean, we did the math and her, her wage had gone down. Um, what, and this was a little bit of a long way of answering the question since you asked. Uh, we needed to get more deeply into this. And at this point, it was uh, our director, Charlie, and me, and Jack McKay. And uh, Charlie was an, an old hippie, and he had a beard, and he had long hair before he started doing this work with the labor movement, then he cut it. Um, you know, bought and learned to wear a suit, uh, you know, on certain occasions. I still couldn't wear high heels if my life depended on it, not that, that day and not now, uh, nor, you know, nor makeup or, or anything. Uh, but we were trying to get more deeply into this stuff, and we found that there was this Miami conference on the Caribbean coming up, where AID was funding this group to bring together the Fusades in El Salvador, and 
all of the different groups like this, there was FIDE in Honduras, there was one for the Dominican Republic, virtually every Central American and Caribbean organization had this USAID funded operation to do this lobbying. There was also major USAID money to build free trade zones, to you know, provide the water and roadways, not for neighborhoods, not for communities and people, but for the free trade zones to get the material in and out. The lobby groups were basically there both to attract people, uh, attract investors and uh, attract apparel and electronics company, companies, but also to strip down their own labor laws. You know, you want to simplify it. You don't want too much of this labor stuff. You want to strip down so um, taxes and tariffs. So no tariffs for the raw materials coming in. You know, no taxes, no tariffs, no, no income tax on these factories who would come down and invest. No, um, you know, no income tax on the executives. No prop, no tax on the profits. A ten-year, you know, a ten-year tax forgiveness. Um, exports, you know, also would go out with, you know, with nothing. That's what a free trade zone is. You get it. It's like an, an, another part of America, tax-wise. In and out country is left with nothing except these low-wage jobs. Um, so anyway, we decided to infiltrate the Miami conference on the Caribbean. And here's ex-hippie Charlie, me, um, Jack McKay, who smoked like a chimney and looked a bit like Charlie, except a smaller version. Uh, and we just, we knew nothing. And first we thought, well, how are we going to do this? We got to form a phony company. We thought, well, you know, we, we certainly can't talk about how you make a shirt, because that's way too fancy. So we thought, well, handkerchiefs. We'll say we make handkerchiefs. And then we learned like thread counts and quality of cotton and all that stuff is really, really difficult. And it's like we were never going to be able to do that. And then uh, the secretary of Jack Schenkman, the president of the union, said, you know, Charlie, you look like a hippie and, and Barbara too. And why don't you say that you're environmentalist, you have inherited money and you're going to start, this was in 1991, you're going to start a cloth bag company and market these cloth bags in supermarkets to replace all that wasteful paper and plastic. And we thought, wow, that's a brilliant idea. idea. And so we called ourselves New Age Textiles. Uh -huh. And we got some Brazilian artist friends of ours to make this beautiful tree of life. And we had a bunch of these bags made on a un in a union shop. And we went down to the Miami Conference on the Caribbean. And we took the place by storm. <laughs> Charlie, Barbara, and Jack, we came down. I mean, Levi Strauss had one person there. You know, VF, I mean, all of the major apparel companies, and they had one representative, two representatives, and they were in this fancy, fancy hotel. We stayed in the Everglades about five blocks down and pretended we were taking a power, power walk as we were coming to the conference every day. Fancy, we, we didn't have enough money, so there were, there were these receptions where they served shrimp and they served all kinds of stuff, and so we would eat at the receptions. Um, the lunches were fabulous but terrifying. We had to sit at these tables with 10 people. We met with the mayor of Rotterdam, who did his best to convince us to market these bags in Europe, and we should bring them in through Rotterdam. Um, we, as shortly after the Miami Conference on the Caribbean, when we took a whole lot of notes, uh, including on some internal meetings that we just innocently walked into, these breakfast meetings that weren't really public, and we sat there took notes. Uh, shortly after that, we talked to 60 Minutes. And 60 Minutes came along with Charlie, New Age Textiles. And they went to Honduras and El Salvador and filmed the free trade zone companies and USAID saying, you know, oh, bring your business here. In Honduras, you can pay the workers 40 cents an hour. In El Salvador, you know, it was the 33 cents an hour. Um, and then we, they actually uh, set the AID guy. They knew they wouldn't be able to get uh, the secret hidden cameras into the embassy because of all the, you know, the electronics detection equipment. And so uh, Charlie came up with a solution. He's got a, a weak stomach anyway. And he said, well, let's just say that our, we ate something that upset our stomachs and we have to stay close to the bathroom. So could they come, could USAID come to the hotel? So they uh, 
set up a table at the restaurant, and they, um, you know, it was a, a long table, and they said their stomachs were off, and AID would come, and they put stuff on the chairs that they didn't want AID to sit at, and they put um, a New Age textiles bag with a hidden camera in it at the end of the table, put the USAID guy over here, practiced eating without getting in the way of the camera. The guy comes, he sits down, and he starts talking, and he completely shoots his mouth off. He says, oh, yeah, it's beautiful here. And they were stupid, and they said, well, um, you know, we had a little bit of trouble in Miami. You know, the workers were, you know, beginning to push for, for more, and they were agitating, and, well, you know, we just really want, and he said, oh, you never have to worry about the thing. You, you went into the free trade zone. You saw that office, you know, over to the side. Well, that's the, the, that's the human resources office. They got a computer in there. They'll help you hire. That computer has a list of anybody who's ever even passed out a pamphlet. He said, you know, the labor people, the sisters or brothers of labor people, all under control. They'll say that one, that one, not that one, not that one. And then he went on and he said, and you know, I mean, the 33 cents an hour, you know, it's like 40 some cents an hour, fully loaded. But don't pay them hourly. Start them that way, but then put them on piece rate and speed them up. You can make a lot of money that way, he said. Um, that went on 60 minutes. Uh, and we, we've, we've often, in the work, been stupid lucky, but this was one of, the, one of the big ones. It went on in September of 1992 in the middle of the George Bush Sr. Clinton campaign. And... All of a sudden, it was just like this. I mean, Ted Koppel said it was like leaving a giant turd on George Bush Sr.'s door. A um, couple days before the thing aired, he knew that it was going to air. He went to the UN and denounced USAID. Nobody knew what he was talking about. They thought he was completely crazy. He's denouncing his own USAID agency. Um, so the thing became a, a big deal in the presidential debate. And uh, New Age Textiles, you know, had, had, had a bit of an impact. It was, it was fun. Um, and what happened, you know, within a couple weeks is that uh, Congress went a little bit crazy. Uh, members of Congress were, you know, shoving one another side in eagerness to get to the microphone to, you know, denounce what USAID was doing and say they really wanted to, you know, protect the rights of workers and, you know, end the, we call it paying to lose our jobs. That was the name of the story. You know, end, end the paying U.S. tax dollars to ship jobs offshore to places where workers' rights were not respected. And pretty quickly, uh, legislation was passed that prohibited USAID from using funds to ship U.S. jobs offshore or in any project where human or workers' rights are violated. Um, it's, you know, I mean, it, it passed. It probably got a bit buried since then. Uh, obviously, workers and human rights are still violated. Uh, but it was the beginning of a process that continues. Thank you for telling that impromptu story that you weren't prepared to tell before. <laughs> um, it's getting close to nine when we usually stop this. Is there any last comment or questions? Okay. Thank you, Barbara, so much. Thank you. This is a, a real honor. Thank you.